the shooting range. In this episode, ages of history, strike aircraft, luxury or necessity, triathlon, deeply modernized early MBTs, and metal beasts, a delicate French tank. The French tech tree has quite a number of great tanks on the way to researching the Leclerc, but there's still a few BRs with fewer machines than required for a comprehensive set. Today's Metal Beast aims to complete one of these vacancies. Please welcome a new modification of the AMX-32 MBT in War Thunder. Armed with a two-plane stabilized 105mm gun with elevation angles between minus 8 and 20 degrees. Auxiliary weapons include a 20mm autocannon and a machine gun. The engine and transmission compartment is in the rear, the driver sits in the front, and three more crew members are in the turret. The ammo racks are divided into two groups, one in the front, another one in the turret rear. When you see this tank for the first time, you can't help but compare it to the familiar later version. And the major difference here is a different cannon. Comparing 105mm to 120mm, you would of course choose the latter. Both its velocity and penetration rate are higher. But practice shows that 105mm might be pretty good for this battle rating too. And this tank has a small advantage, by the way. The later version's turret rear can only house 17 rounds in the first stage, while the earlier one has 19. Doesn't sound like much, right? But when you only fill this rack, a couple more shots certainly wouldn't hurt. Speaking of, limiting your ammo is a wise decision if you drive this French tank. It can't boast much in the armor or internal space departments, so you might want to improve your survivability any way you can, including a limit on the ammo you take. Now, the gun is naturally the first thing you'd compare, but the main difference between the two AMX-32s lies elsewhere. What we think is more noticeable is the difference in engines. Just a hundred horsepower less, but the effect on the dynamics feels much bigger than that. The only way it can achieve its top speed of 65 kilometers an hour is racing across the biggest maps. This factor has a significant effect on your tactics. The tank has everything it needs to be in the front, to flank, or to breach defenses, except for the speed advantage. Does it make the AMX-32-105 a bad tank? No way! It still has its good elevation angles, turret turn speed, thermals, fast reverse, smokes, commander controls, all the goodies are there. The autocannon alone is crazy. It can cover you while you're reloading, knock out a few enemy aircraft, remove a couple fences to clear up the way. It's super useful. The new AMX is ready to complete your rank 6 French sets. As for its complicated nature, well, we can live with that. Why would the United States create the Apache when they already had the Cobra? There are two opinions in the world of aviation, somewhat polar, yet surprisingly complementary. The first one states that the US had absolutely no need to make a new combat helicopter in the early 1970s. The Cobra was already doing a great job. It had been proven in the Vietnam jungles, and it still had an enormous modernization potential. It wasn't the Army that wanted to develop a brand new combat helicopter, it was the American aircraft companies. They were eager to try the Bell Company's way of making profit. It had managed to create the Cobra in a very short time thanks to using the internal design of the already mass-produced Huey. Now, the other popular opinion is the opposite. They say the Cobra was mostly a temporary solution forced by a lack of time and limited resources, and it obviously had a lot of unsolvable issues and unfixable flaws. It reminds us of the World War II night fighter story. The early ones were based on bombers and heavy twin-engined fighters, but the engineers soon realized it was only a half measure and started to design new ones from scratch. The Heinkel 219 and the Northrop P61 are good examples of that. The same thing happened to strike helicopters. 
Even by the early 1970s, it was evident that they had to be designed from scratch rather than based on something else. The tech and electronics of the times imposed a limit on what a light and compact helicopter could be equipped with. Meanwhile, new anti-air measures of the potential aggressor were evolving very quickly, obviously not in the Cobra's favor. Besides, the very fact of its existence was a bad example for everyone, both to the Allies and to the opponents. If the Americans managed to create a good combat machine using a light multi-role helicopter in only half a year, what's stopping other nations from doing the same? When the European militaries got their orders of Hueys, they started wondering why they shouldn't design their own replacements. They'd eventually get to a point when they'd have to order a strike helicopter with a much higher price tag, and that's when they'd just go and make their own model, based on previously designed replacements. That makes a very fair reason for creating a new combat helicopter, a more powerful one, with more versatility, better survivability, one capable of performing its tasks at any time of the day and in any weather. A helicopter that would make everyone forget about trying to make a temporary in-home helicopter solution. So, who was right? The 21st century shows that both sides are simultaneously right and wrong. As usual, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Yes, the United States threw a grand competition for a new combat helicopter design, which the McDonnell Douglas Company won. They made the famous Apache, a chopper that earned the title of the most mass-produced helicopter in its class by the 21st century. Even the Soviet Union confirmed that the Apache Way was the best one by creating its own strike helicopters from scratch. But at the same time, more machines used the Cobra concept and succeeded. The Italian A129 Mangusta, the Chinese Z19, and, to a lesser degree, the French-German Tiger. Only time will tell whose approach is better. No matter how good modern vehicles are, time frequently publishes new requirements. Today's triathlon will feature those machines whose engineers managed to give them a second chance by completing deep upgrades. Please welcome the participants. The M60 AMBT and the Magach 7C. The M48 Super and the CM11. The Oliphant Mark II and the STRV 105. And the T55 AMD1. We'll start with a race across fields, snow, and desert. The drivers line up their tanks at the start line, and... Go! At first, there seems to be no leader, but after a couple hundred meters, the M60 gets the lead. Then we see the M48 and the Oliphant going together. Next is the Magach, and the rest of the race is lagging behind. The snowy area helps the German tank to solidify its position while the desert sees a fight for fourth place. The riverbed produces no change and the race nears the finish line. The M60 has been leading and expectedly finishes first. Then we see the M48 and the Oliphant while the T55 manages to snatch fourth place. Now let's check the defenses of these machines. None of them can survive a finned DS round, so we'll stick to capped BR-472 rounds and hot ATGMs shot from 500 meters away. The hull and the turret of the M60 can sustain most hits with capped rounds, but it still has vulnerable areas like the turret ring and the commander's cupola. The M48 has a weaker protection level. It has additional weaknesses in the lower glacis and the gun mantlet. The T-55 shows the best result here. Only the flattest parts of its turret are vulnerable. The Elephant's turret can take a punch, but its hull armor could be stronger. The CM-11 is the opposite. Its hull holds, but the turret could use some help. The STRV seems to be struggling the worst since it can be penned pretty much anywhere, while the Magok's armor is similar to the M60s. Good, except for a few spots. Missile hits are a bit easier to compare. Only the thickest parts of the Magach's turret can sustain a hit with one. But there's also one tank that the ATGM couldn't even hit. We mean, of course, the T-55 with its active protection system. At this battle rating, it's a major advantage. 
And now let's give our contestants a chance to demonstrate their own firepower. We'll take one of the thickest enemies we can find for a target, the Israeli Merkava 2D tank. We'll place one with its front facing the shooters and another one with its side. The distance is set at one kilometer. The M60 lays its first shell into the engine compartment and pierces the target right through. Other competitors don't have such powerful rounds, so they all have to shoot again to incapacitate the crew. The T-55 is having some trouble here. Its sub-caliber rounds are the weakest. With its second shot, the M60 destroys the second target and finishes the stage. The CM-11's crew reports success next, thanks to its reload time of only 5 seconds. The rest of the competition takes just a little longer to finish. The Soviet tank expectedly took the longest, but it used a capped shell against the sideways target. Other tanks don't even have this type of ordnance. Let's sum up. The Soviet T-55 AMD-1 gets the bronze today thanks to its reliable armor, good ammo choice, and active protection system. The silver is shared by the Israeli Magok 7C and the German M48 Super. They have a great balance of speed, armor, and firepower. And the winner today is, of course, the M60 AMBT. It has the best mobility, decent armor, and the best finned round. And now, while the tank crews argue who was better at the beginning of their careers, we'll answer some of your questions from the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Roomba. Which is better, MiG-23 or MiG-27? Hi, Roomba. It's a bit unfair to compare them directly since one is a fighter jet and the other one is a strike aircraft. We'll just say that your choice depends on what tasks you'd like to perform in battle. Hazik Gaming asks, How do you properly play the Leopard 2K? I just recently unlocked it. Hey, Hazik Gaming. This Leopard is a great choice for aggressive play. Don't hesitate to push for the center of the map or even the enemy side of the map early. Change your position after a couple of hits to avoid giving your enemy an advantage. And don't forget about the 20mm autocannon. It's great against light vehicles, enemy barrels and tracks, and even aircraft bold enough to get closer. Another question comes from Banana Jam. Could we maybe see a triathlon of American 6.7 heavy tanks? Hey, Banana Jam, now that's a great idea. We'll think about how to organize this triathlon. See it in one of the next episodes. FL Studio Remakes writes, How can I drop all the GBU guided bombs at the same time for the same target? Hello, FL Studio. With laser guided bombs, you can even drop the entire load onto a single target but not with the TV-guided ones. Each homing device on those needs a separate target lock, which takes time. And the last comment for today was written by TBCN. Can you film a whole team of B-29s dropping all their 4,500-pound bombs at the same time? It just looks so epic when bombers drop their bombs. Hi, TBCN. Sure, why not? One of the advantages of our game is the opportunity to film such large-scale scenes with dozens of planes and hundreds of bombs with no hassle. Enjoy! That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to fuel your bombs and arm your aircraft's fuse, leave a like, Share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.